Truman called the expulsive power of a new affection. And his point was that the only time your affections change is when you have a new affection that is stronger and it casts out the affection lower or that is now taken second place. It's like the riddle that if you're running as fast as you can and you overtake the man in second place, what position are you in? No, second. You're still in second. And there, right? Yeah, right. And that's what happens. This, this is the type of thing that happens. You think you're somewhere, but you're not. And this is the way that affections work. You, you think, oh, I finally got there, but you're not. You're still, in, you're still in second place. And so the problem that you have with affections is what they do. So I'm just going to run through a list of what happens if your affections are not ordered correctly. Here's just a, a few. Relationships change. Okay, so if you're in one relationship, that relationship will change if you're married, um, depending on the order of your affections. Okay, so you imagine being married. Well, some of you are married, so you don't need to imagine it. And I want you to, without your affections being ordered correctly, your marriage begins to change in accordance with your affections. Now, because there are two in the marriage, a husband and a wife, if the husband's affections are not mirroring the wife's affections and vice versa, then they begin to go in separate directions. This is called trouble in paradise. Okay, the marriage is supposed to be a place of paradise. When you argue, it's trouble in paradise, and you have to figure out a way of sorting that out. And the only way to sort that out is through the ordering of affections. Okay, that's when it comes to... Um, marriages. Or what about the same for children? Well, the Ordo Amoris is normally attached to Christian education. In fact, if you pick up some uh, philosophy on how to educate children, at some point in the classical education stream, you're going to come across this phrase, um, Ordo Amoris, which is you have to order your affections. So, for instance, if you have a son or a daughter that wants this job, and this job requires physics and mathematics, but they're sort of 11 and 12, and they don't like physics and mathematics, how do you get them to do physics and mathematics with all their effort if they don't enjoy it? This is a real difficulty, because we find the things that we do easier if we enjoy them, if we can see an investment in them, if we can see an output. So what you have to do is you have to order the affections in education to show them that if you want this, okay, here, to get there, you need to do this, this, and this, and this. So you're keeping their mind and heart on the ultimate goal, and then they understand that because this is the ultimate affection, that all the other things then work towards it. Makes sense? So you order the affections that way. But when it comes to um, priorities in the Christian life, now that the Christian life relates to the educational life of your children or the work life of your children, the work life of you, how does that happen? So <clears throat> what I'm going to show you uh, this morning is that if the order of affections is not happening, one, it needs to happen, and two, making it happen is the most difficult thing. And the reason being is because um, you can educate yourself or even your children, but that does not keep them safe from loving the world. Okay, so education won't do it. Even the best theological education won't do it because that is nothing more than being a hearer of the word. We're now, st we're now stepping into being a doer of the word, as James would say. So let me just take you through the three that we have to take into consideration. First of all, to love God and to love your neighbor is both a, um, a spiritual reality that exists within the Trinity itself, love, and then it has a practical output in actually loving one another. Okay. So when you hear Jesus say in the Sermon of the Mount, 
you have heard it said, but I say unto you, we tend to think that he's correcting their theology. That's partly true, but that's not really what he's saying. What he's saying is, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, don't do this, don't do that. In other words, they are hearers of the word, they're not doers. They've heard it said, but they're not, they're not doing anything with what they've heard. And then Jesus takes it to the internal level, not just the external behavior. Okay, so not, they've heard it, but they're not doing it. But they're not doing it internally either. So there's an eternal, in, internal issue. And so to truly love, uh, when you listen to Jesus, you have to love internally. Your internal motivations towards God and others have to be matched or will have to match up with your external, or your external ones match up with your internal ones. So the actions mirror the motivations of the heart, or else you end up in hypocrisy. So to love God and to love your neighbor means that you have to hear it, then you have to do it, but it has to be an internal reality as well as an external reality. Okay. So any man who looks at a woman with lust in his eyes has committed adultery. Well, that's that's not, a, that's not a practical issue. That's an internal heart issue, okay? The practical issue is, you know, don't do it physically. So secondly, we have desires, abilities, and opportunities, which we have seen. How desires change, the abilities that we have, the opportunities that we have. And then the third point is where I want us to focus all on today is how does your love for God grow? So if you want a person to not love the world, one of your children to not grow up loving the world, how does their love for God grow? It's a difficult one because most people are not actually sure how I grow my love for God. So, you know, because we're not sure. So I want you to think about it. So you, you teach your child Maths, science, English, geography, teach them all of this, and they grow academically. Okay, then when school's over, you feed them with food and drink and water throughout the day, and then they grow physically. Okay, so you're seeing them grow in two areas, but the area that I'm con concentrating on now is how do they grow in the area of love for God? How do you grow in the area of love for God. And this is where we really begin to order the, order the affections correctly. It's very easy to order the affections when it comes to education. You simply put what they want to do or want to be as the prize, and then you put everything else in the order to get that prize. So if you want to win the race, you have to train. If you want to train, you have to exercise. If you want to ex exercise, you have to get up at certain times, right? It's, it's order, it's easy to order those affections, to put it into steps. But, I, but how do you teach someone to love God? What do they have to do to love God uh, properly? Well, here's the principle. The only way, the only way that a person loves God is through the appreciation of what God has done for them. So in your Bibles, it's Psalm 116. This is what we read. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because, and we all know that because is a reason is going to follow, because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Okay, that sounds fairly simple. The only way your love for God will grow is if you understand the reasons for it growing. And the reasons for your love growing comes down to your children learning to appreciate and yourselves learning to appreciate what God has done for you. Okay, what God has done for you. So we love God because he... Right, so we all know that. How did he love us? 
So the, so the issue here is, is we can give a general answer. We can say something like, he loves us because he sent his son to die on the cross, to rise from the grave, to pay for my sins. Okay. But your love still isn't growing at that point. What sins? When your children come before God and pray, Lord, forgive us for our sins, how is that, how is that growing their appreciation for forgiveness if they don't know what their sins are? It can't. So they're going through the motion of saying, Lord, please forgive me for my sins. But if they have no apprehension of what the sin is, they can have no apprehension of the greatness of forgiveness for that sin. And so there's no growth. They just don't grow. So it's really important that when your children are growing up and you say, look, when you ask God for the forgiveness of sins, what are you asking him to forgive? Or well, my sins, what sins? What sins, right? And only when they, begin to, when they begin to see what they are actually doing, do will they then begin to appreciate the forgiveness for those sins. Because if you keep it at a general level, God forgives sins, I'm a sinner, there's no growth. Because there's no real apprehension of forgiveness, because there's no real apprehension of the sin. Does that make sense? So. It's, there's, there's only real growth and love for God when there is a full apprehension of what God has done for us. And to appreciate what God has done for us, we have to appreciate what we are. So when you sin, if you, you know, when you ask your children, when they sat on the tape, if you ask your children, when you sin, why does it offend God? Why does your sin offend God? And if you, if you realize that actually I'm not getting the answers, you now begin to appreciate that they're, they're gaining biblical knowledge, but they're not growing in love for the Lord. Right? Because it, you can't grow in love for the Lord unless there's a full appreciation of what is happening. And when they are growing in this area, now you get the ordo amoris. You get the ordering of affections. Now you really are loving God first. Okay, so I love the Lord because he has heard, because he has done these things. In other words, the man understands his condition, and then he understands the greatness of his deliverance in light of his condition, and therefore he's able to truly appreciate what God has done for him. Okay? I'll give you another example. The example would be... Um, the woman in scripture that only put in a couple of pennies into the offering, but that was all that she had compared to others who put in a great deal. How are we supposed to respond to what Jesus is saying there? Okay, well, if you, if you set aside the issues of trusting God for the future, for the next day, for your daily bread, you're only left with the offering itself. Okay, you're only left with the offering itself. So if, for instance, someone gave me, someone gave me a hundred pounds, a hundred dollars, okay, and that was their last a hundred dollars to help me out because I didn't have any food, right? How much greater is that than somebody else giving me a hundred dollars? Or is it the same? Now, on a surface level, we would say it's the same because I'm receiving the same. Okay, but there's another dimension to it because if one person has 10 million in the bank and the other person only has 100 in the bank, suddenly you appreciate the gift all the more. So we appreciate the gift in relationship to the cost. Does that make sense? The cost to the other individual. So God gave us how many of his sons? Well, he only has one. Like one son, his only begotten son, he gave. And God the Son came. And these, these, this understanding this helps us to appreciate the importance of, of cost and value when it comes to truly appreciating what God has done for us. In other words, if you leave out the details, your love only grows in proportion to what you know. 
In other words, you can only do the parts of the Bible you understand. And so with limited Bible knowledge comes a limited Christian life because you can only live in accordance with what you know. Because you can't obey something you don't know, so you're not obeying. Does, does this make sense? Are you beginning to appreciate the depth that you have to go to? So as you think about ordering your affections now, the only way to truly order your affections is to truly appreciate the value and cost of every single thing. So let's just use the illustration of education again. Okay. What is the value, <clears throat> what is the value of me at my age learning astrophysics? Now can, you can be honest, you can say, Daniel, there is no way you're going to space. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks, yeah. There's no way. So, so now, I begin to, now I begin to say it doesn't matter how much I love astrophysics or just, like, there's no value there, okay, because it's, it's not going to create any difference in me going forward. And so what would happen to my Christian life then if I loved astrophysics more than God? Well, two things are beginning to happen. One... <laughs> I'm beginning to love something greater than God and therefore I'm loving God less. Two, I am loving something that cannot, give, that cannot do anything for me. Because, you know, if I was, say, perhaps 15 and I had a love for astrophysics, then I would have the possibility of perhaps becoming a physicist or something like that. So I want you to understand that the children especially as they grow up can grow a love for things that may not actually profit them even though those things are, there's nothing wrong with them does that make sense and it's the same for you as adults that you can get a love for something where there is nothing wrong with the thing itself but if you're if it reorders your affections then it reorders your focus it reorders your commitments it reorders your attention it reorders everything and so you have to appreciate everything in relationship to its value and to its cost and to its specifics. So as your children grow up and they confess their sins, if they don't know what their sins are, they're not loving God more at the end of it. Their love for God is not, it just can't grow. Because unless it's specific, unless you send uh, I, I am confessing this sin, and I know that in Christ, God has forgiven me for this sin. That relationship between what God is doing for me because of what I know about myself creates a greater love for God because it creates a greater apprehension of what God has done for me. And this is the only way to have your affections ordered in your Christian life. And so I want you to think about this more and more as you think about everything you have in your life. So the classic question would be this. None of you have to answer this, but I want you to be honest and answer it as quickly as you can in your head. Are you ready? So none of you have to answer this out loud, but I want you to be really honest with yourself and answer it as quickly as possible. What is the one thing that if you lost it tonight, you could never have it again, that you wouldn't want to wake up and live tomorrow? Now, whatever that thing was, that's either taken God's place or it is God. And now you begin to understand your order of affections. The thing you love the most is the thing you don't want to lose the most. And that applies to every affection you have. That applies, applies to everything. And so sometimes parents can get incredibly frustrated, for instance, when they are educating their children because you want the best for your children and yet they have no love for the things that you're teaching them. And the reason being is because they see their future different than you or 
they don't see their future, which is more often the case. And if you don't see your future, it is then incredibly difficult to order your affections because you don't know where you're going. But because we know in Christ we have eternal life and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and we know what the future is, now it becomes possible to have our affections ordered. Because now we know where everything is going and therefore where everything should be lined up. But if what you came up with an answer in your head that was not Christ, but it was something else, okay, then that is showing you which is the priority and the greatest affection in your life. And it doesn't matter if you turn around and say, well, no, no, Daniel, if you ask me the question again, I'm, I would say Christ. I didn't think you meant Christ. It doesn't matter. The fact that your mind and heart didn't go there is an indication to you that your mind and heart didn't go there. Okay, it went somewhere else. And so when you default, okay, when you get tired and you're not pursuing the Christian life and you default, you default into the order of affections according to other desires that you have. And so how do you get yourself back to loving God first? This is the question. How do you get yourself to the place where you're really loving God first? Well, you have to go back again, and you have to be specific. It's not enough to say, I love God because he forgave me for my sins. It has to be, I love God because I know he's forgiven me for this, for this, for, and be really, not publicly, but between you and God. And understand that God has dealt with you personally, and privately to save you from the embarrassment of your peers. And you are completely free, completely <laughs> forgiven. And so now that you're this very clean and righteous person before God, think about what it does before God for you then to start loving something else. Right? And every parent's felt this, right? Every parent has felt you know, working really hard over a meal, and then the people at the table don't eat it, right? That, that, the reason that hurts so much is because you've put investment in, and the people don't appreciate the same investment that you've put in, right? Or <clears throat> your children grow up in the home, you do everything for them, you know, and when they get to the age where they can actually carry things, and move things, and you ask them, they don't. And the reason it hurts so much is because you look at so many years of asking them to do things, uh, sorry, doing things for them, and you'd think, oh, they're bound to remember. They are bound to remember everything that I have done for them. And so when I ask them, can you pick up your salts or can you move that box, they're bound to remember that I've cooked them all these meals. They're bound to remember that I've bought them all these clothes and I've took them out to the park and I took them to the beach and, you know, <clears throat> I got them a chocolate bar or whatever. They're bound to remember. And yet they go, no. And the reason they say no, the reason they say no is because they are not appreciating again what, they has, what has been done for them. So we love God because he first loved us. And so if you want your children to grow up loving you, what do they have to appreciate? They have to learn to appreciate how you have loved them. But if they don't appreciate how you have loved them, they're not going to then love you back because that is how love works. Okay? It is that now it's not just a reciprocal nature, though there is a reciprocation there. Um, but it is impossible. I've struggled with this for years. I mean, Susan's heard me preach on this a number of times about is it possible to love God with my own love? And I have studied and I've read books and I've listened to other people and I've come to the conclusion it's just not possible. It is not possible for me to love God with my own love, love that I can muster up all by myself. The only way I can love God is by appreciating his love for me first. So we love God because he first loved us. And when you appreciate that, then the order of the home is so much better. And the order of your Christian life is so much better. 
And, you know, the order of education is so much better because now we begin to appreciate value, cost, the future. All of these things are put into the right order and then they work properly. Okay? And so, as children grow up, if you can spot in your child, for instance, and children, I don't want you to, you don't need to, I ask the, the, pet, the adults a question. I'm going to ask you a question, okay? You don't need to answer out loud, but I just want you to be really honest and answer it to yourself as quick as you can. Are you ready? Have you ever, <clears throat> have you ever been asked to do something by your mum and dad and it took them more than, <clears throat> and they had to ask you more than once before you did it? You didn't even have to nod, but there's a few nods, okay. Have you ever been asked by your mum and dad to do something and you have not done it, even though you know you have been asked to do it? Right. And now here's the trickiest question. Do you know why that happens? Now, the simple answer would be, and this is where we go wrong, we give the simple general answer and we go, it's because of sin. It is because of sin. But what sin? What is the sin that's causing that? And the specific sin that's causing that is not appreciating being loved this way. Right? So every time we love something more than God, we are saying that we've not appreciated God's love for us. That's all that it is. So it's, it's, a, it's a simple sin to understand. That you're not truly appreciating what God has actually done for you. Because your Christian life has been generalized. And so your Christian parenting becomes generalized. And though you begin to see these problems, you're, you fail to identify where the root of the problem actually is. And so you fail to address those issues. Because they have to be specific. So Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord because, because, and then the following. He is specific about his condition, and he is fully <clears throat> appreciative of what God has done for him. And so if you, if you come to Sunday school and you just understand these lessons generally and don't take them to yourself specifically, you're not going to grow. Your love for God is not going to grow. As you parent your children, if you want them to start loving you back and to grow in their love for you, they first need to be able to see your love for them. And they don't see it automatically in the same way you don't see it automatically with God. You see it generally, but you need to see it specifically because it's the, it's the specific is the personal. The general is the everybody. So, Lord, I know you have forgiven my, my sins. It's my sins which makes it personal. Lord, I know you forgive sins in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but, Lord, you have forgiven my sins, and I know what my sins are. The ones that I know, I know. And as I think about those sins, and as I think about God's forgiveness for those sins, then even if I'm not loving God before that point, as I should, I will be afterwards because it reorientates my affections for God. Yeah? That makes sense? Does anyone have any thoughts or questions on that before I sort of bring it to a, bring it to a conclusion? Yeah. Right? And then the part A comment, and you can articulate and add, add to it and correct it if you think. The second part is 
there's this theology out there, belief system, and it's in, incorrect, that oftentimes Christians, hopefully not our church, hopefully not our denomination, but church, Christians generically don't believe God conquered sin at the cross. That's down the road to come. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do it at the cross, so therefore we never can really repent from our sins. Right. Yeah, and I yeah I, I agree with both. I think the second one is 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 very true. Is it is the the, the um, Romans six? Well, my favorite my favorite passage to go to in light of what Arnie's uh, Mr. Evans has just said is that uh, Donna McLeod um, says that almost no book needs to be written on antinomianism, which is um, I don't have to obey God's law; I can do as I please. And he was saying it tongue in cheek, but the reason he said it is because the grace of God, Titus 2, teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Okay, teacher. So we don't even have to <clears throat> we don't even have to go to a book or anything. The very grace of God in our life teaches us to say no to sin because we can do it. But the trouble is, is again, there's the there's the ignorance that we tend to think that because we live in a sinful body, we are bound to commit sin. Now, I don't believe, in, as Wesley pointed out, in a sinless perfection. Although, in fairness, it wasn't John Wesley who ever claimed Christian perfectionism. It was his followers, which is, which is often the case with most of these that, that go wrong, you know. Um, if, you, if you read, um, you know, John Calvin never came up with a tulip acronym. Right, he never came up with that. In fact, the, the only time when he really mentions the relationship between the elect and what have you, uh, specifically in a biblical theology, would be his commentaries on 1 John. But it's his followers who then take it to hyper-Calvinism and all of that kind of stuff. You know, followers, they, they always cause trouble for the, the main guy, you know. Um, but Donald McLeod pointed out that we have been definitively sanctified which means that you have, by the power of the Spirit, the ability to say yes to God and no to sin. In other words, you can do that. Will you win every single time? No, you won't. But you can actually say no to sin. It's difficult because this morning in James, we're concentrating on the untamable tongue. You know, how do you control something untamable? I mean, it seems contradictory, but this is where we're going to. And the thing is, I think the congregation will love it this morning because it's the teacher that gets the, the preaching to. The congregation are led off this morning. It's the teacher that gets the, the message preached to in this morning because it's all about those who desire to be teachers. Yeah, and don't be. Um, he discourages them. So let me finish with this then. Um, and I'll finish with, <clears throat> with what... <clears throat> Um, Arnie's brought up, uh, Mr. Abrams has brought up because it ties into what I'm about to say next. And that is because, because Christ at the cross has defeated and broken the bondage that we are in, that our union with Adam, uh, and we now have union with Christ, it means that we can say yes to God and no to sin. But the moment we find ourselves sinning, it goes back to what I was saying a couple of weeks, or in the last six lessons that we have had up to this point, that when Jesus said, as I said at the beginning of this lesson, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, he is also dealing with um, the sins that exist even if our eyes are closed. Because the imagination is a sin generator, it, it, right? because that's what comes out of the heart. You know, if you can imagine it, then it's possible to actually uh, commit it. And so how do you then deal with the, the seriousness of sin? Well, if I sinned in my dream, should I then confess that when I'm awake? Or should I say, well, it, it wasn't really me. I was dreaming it. And I've had enough experiences and with others 
to understand that a person can fall out with one person in their dream and then see that person in real life the following day and are not the same towards them. Why? Because whatever gets our mind gets us. Whatever gets into our heart and gets, gets us. And so what you're realizing is though you can say, well, technically I didn't sin, okay, what it's showing you is that sin resides to permanently cause you trouble. Per but the way you deal with it is by understanding that you have to deal with it at the level of thoughts, and you've heard me say this in prayers, thoughts, words, and deeds. Thoughts, words, and deeds. That when we confess our sins, we do so in thoughts, in words, and in deeds, so that we can echo the very lesson that Jesus is giving when he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, and then he goes into the, the realm of what you can believe and imagine in your heart not just the outward action. Okay, so now we're getting down to real specifics. So if I was to summarize the lesson this morning, it would simply be, if you are to grow in your love for God, or if anyone is to grow in their love for the other, you have to appre truly appreciate the specifics of that relationship. Because if there's only general parts, it becomes a general love. But if there are specific parts, become, your love becomes very specific. I love you because of this. I love you because of that. Okay, it becomes very reasons. Now, God loves us because he loves us just because he loves us. God has set his love upon us. This is the very root of the theology of the atonement. He has set his love upon us, which is very different than forgiveness because forgiveness is an action based on the love of God. And we, we looked at that actually last week. We touched on it at least last week in the sermon. But I want you to appreciate that as you see your children growing up, that the one thing you want them to grow uh, in is in the one area that you can't see. You can see them growing physically. You can see them growing academically. And you cannot see if they're growing in their love for Christ. Not as easy. You will say, well, there'll be fruit. Yeah, there will be fruit, but some fruit takes a long time to come out. It takes a long time to mature. What's it? You know, you plant most trees. I think if you plant an apple tree, it takes, what, about eight years before it bears any fruit, possibly? I don't know. And I'm not saying that that is a perfect illustration of what it's like with children, but I'm just saying that the, the, the fruit-bearing years tend to be after a number of years. You begin to see more and more of God's grace coming out in their lives. But the point that I'm trying to make is you have to be really specific. So when you say to your children, let's confess their sins, you have to get your children to really appreciate how they have sinned against God. And if they don't know, you then have to explain it because then they can appreciate how they have been loved by God and how they have been forgiven for that. And it's the same for you as well. I'll finish, let me pray. Father God, we thank you that we love you because you first loved us. And the way that you have loved us is uh, in a way that we can only ever get to know more and more of. We understand it. We understand it at one level. And we pray that over the years of our Christian life, we would grow in our understanding of how you have loved us so that we may grow in our love for you and others. In Jesus' name, amen.